Welcome to our series on standard costing and variance analysis. This series will begin by looking at what standard costing is, and then continue to show how a standard costing system can be used to perform variance analysis. In this video, we will be focusing on the idea of a standard costing system. What are our learning objectives for this video? First, we want to understand what a standard cost is. We will then explain how a standard costing system differs from a normal and actual costing system. Next, we will consider the circumstances in which a standard costing system can be applied. We will then explain how a standard costing system works. After this, we will discuss how companies go about establishing standards, and we then consider the benefits of a standard costing system. Finally, we will end with a discussion on how to prepare a set of standard costing accounts. So what is a standard cost? A standard cost is simply a predetermined cost to produce one unit of a product under efficient operating conditions. It is important to understand how a standard cost differs from a budgeted cost. A standard cost is a predetermined cost per unit, while a budgeted cost is the expected cost for the activity, operation, or process in total. Let us look at a small example to see how a standard cost differs from a budgeted cost and how they are related to one another. So in our example, a company plans to produce 10,000 units of some product. They estimate the total cost of this production to be 30,000 Rand. We are then asked to determine the budgeted cost and the standard cost of this production. Based on what we have just discussed, take a moment to determine these two items. Great, well done. The budgeted cost is 30,000 Rand because it is the total cost for the production. The standard cost is then the total cost divided by the number of units produced to give us a standard cost of 3 Rand per unit. A standard cost is typically recorded on a standard cost card. Notice what goes into the standard cost card. First, we have a quantity standard for each type of material, labor, and manufacturing overhead used. This quantity standard provides us with details on how much of a resource a unit of production requires. We also have a price standard for each individual unit. This details the costs of one unit of resource required. So the standard price of materials is 40 Rand per kilogram of direct materials. The standard price of labor is 30 Rand per labor hour. And the standard price of manufacturing overheads is 15 Rand per hour. If we multiply out the standard quantity and price standard, we get the total per unit for each component of the product. These are then summed together to provide us with the total manufacturing cost per unit. Now that we know what a standard cost is, we need to be able to explain how a standard costing system differs from a normal or actual costing system. We already know that a standard costing system uses a predetermined cost for materials, labor, and overheads. An actual system as its name suggests, uses the actual cost of materials, labor, and overheads. So what about a normal costing system then? A normal costing system uses actual costs for the direct items of materials and labor. However, it uses predetermined costs for the allocation of fixed overheads, which is why we will get an under or over recovery. An important consideration is whether the use of standard costing is allowed for external reporting purposes. Let's look at IAS 2, paragraph 21. We see here that the standard costing method is allowed if the results approximate cost. The accounting standard then explains to us what they mean by standard costs, which is the same as what we have already discussed. 
Finally, it notes that these standards must be regularly reviewed and updated in light of current economic conditions. This is an expectation of any standard costing system. So now that we know the difference between the different costing systems, we need to ask ourselves when a standard costing system would apply. A standard costing system would be useful in a standard cost center. So let's unpack what a standard cost center is. First, a cost center is a responsibility center where the managers are only accountable for the costs directly under their control. A standard cost center then is a cost center where the output is measurable and the input required for each unit can be specified. Based on this, a standard costing system is best suited when the input can be specified and the operations are common or repetitive. These conditions allow for standards to be set. These conditions typically occur in a manufacturing environment, so standard costing systems are typically applied to manufacturing activities and not to non-manufacturing activities. However, in some cases, they can be extended when the conditions are met. So how does a standard costing system work? The first step is to establish the responsibility centers. A responsibility center is any department or division in a company where an individual manager is responsible for that department or division's performance. Once this has been done, we can set the standards. We will look at some considerations for setting standards on the next slide. We then need to determine the standard cost of actual output for each responsibility center. We can do this by flexing the budget. We will look at flexing the budget in our next video in the series. After we have flexed the budget, we compare the standard costs of the actual output to the actual costs incurred to determine any variances. The calculation of variances will make up the majority of this series on standard costing and variance analysis. Once we have calculated the variances, we need to investigate them and take corrective action. We will discuss the principles of which variances to investigate towards the end of the series. Finally, we need to continually monitor and update the standards to ensure they remain reflective of efficient operating conditions and the prevailing economy. So two primary approaches now to setting standards. The first is to use historical records. This is where we use historical information to estimate the current standards. Conceptually, it is similar to the idea of incremental budgeting. The second method is to use engineering studies. This is when we perform detailed studies on each product and operation to determine the input specifications. Conceptually, this approach aligns more with something like zero-based budgeting. Our standards are then recorded on a cost card. You will remember our example from earlier. When setting our standards, remember that for each input into the product, we will have a quantity and price standard. Our quantity standard needs to consider issues such as the quality of our materials, labor, and machinery, any expected wastage, the effects of learning curves, the skill levels of our staff, and any unavoidable idle time. Our price standard then needs to consider issues such as supply quotations, price seasonality, volume discounts, market prices, and contractual labor rates. When establishing our standards, we also need to consider the motivational effect of the standards we set. There are three types of standards, and they will have a different effect on the motivation of our departmental managers. First, we have basic standards. Basic standards are typically standards that are left unchanged over long periods of time, maybe only adjusted for inflation. These standards typically do not recognize current targets as they do not consider the changing market conditions, other than inflation, and changing production processes. As a result, they are likely to include inefficiencies. Therefore, these standards are unlikely to motivate because they are just not in line with the current practice. Maybe they are too easy to obtain because they have never been adjusted 
for past inefficiencies. Next, we have ideal standards. These are standards that represent perfect performance. They don't account for any inefficiencies, not even expected or normal inefficiencies. Again, this type of standard is unlikely to motivate staff. Rather, they will demotivate staff as they are simply unattainable. Finally, we have achievable standards. This type of standard represents what is attainable and efficient, but not perfect operating conditions in the current economic climate. Thus, unlike basic standards, they account for current operational and economical circumstances. And unlike ideal standards, they account for a normal level of inefficiency. Therefore, these standards are likely to motivate employees. So what are the benefits of operating a standard costing system? First, under a standard costing system, we can perform a detailed variance analysis. This variance analysis, which we will look at over the course of the series, allows us to identify activities that are not operating efficiently. Next, because of the convenience standard costs supply, they help us set the budgets. It saves us time in trying to determine how much costs will be incurred. Because standard costing assists with setting the budget, and it highlights activities that are inefficient, it can help us to evaluate the performance of management. Variances are allocated to responsibility centers, and managers can be rewarded or held accountable based on the variances. As we have discussed earlier, setting challenging but achievable standards can also have a positive effect on employee motivation. Next, standard costs can assist us with decision making because there are future costs which eliminate any avoidable inefficiencies. Thus, they provide more reliable information for decision making. Finally, standard costing simplifies the tracking of costs through the accounting system. Inventories and cost of sales are simply recorded at their standard costs, with the variances being written off as a period cost. We will see this next when we are looking at preparing a set of standard costing accounts. The final issue we need to look at is the overarching principles when preparing a set of standard costing accounts. We will cover detailed journal entries throughout the series. First, all inventories, meaning finished goods, work in progress, and raw materials, are recorded at the standard cost. Variances are then treated as a period cost. However, if the standard is found to be incorrect, the variances should be apportioned between the cost of sales and inventory values. Finally, remember that all inventories need to be valued at the lower of cost or net realizable value. Let's see how this works in a diagram. First, the standard costs are used to measure the cost of production. If this production is sold, it is expensed through the statement of profit or loss through cost of sales. If the production is not sold, then it is recorded as inventory in the statement of financial position. These standards are then compared to the actual costs to calculate the variances. If the standards are accurate, they are written off as a period cost through cost of sales, meaning that the cost of sales now represents the actual costs. However, if the standards are not accurate, then the variances need to be apportioned with some being expensed through cost of sales and some being adjusted to the inventory values in the statement of financial position. That brings us to the end of our first video on standard costing and variance analysis. Join us for our next video where we will look at the flexible budget. See you next time.